This is a quick start guide to how to use APA. It does not cover every single thing, but it covers most of the information that you'll need uh, for research papers that you write. Not only does it cover how to do an APA in-text citation and end reference, it also talks about how you can find good sources as well as how to paraphrase those sources. Now, although you have access to this document, I'm going to kind of go through it briefly and highlight some really key things. <clears throat> So the first thing, because you're going to be writing about science in this class, it's really good, not just for science, but for all subjects, to find good sources. There's lots of websites out there that have a lot of information, some of it good, some of it not so good. Now the best information on scientific topics are going to come from peer-reviewed scientific journal articles. Now, a lot of these you actually have to pay for, but what's nice about having an affiliation with a college is that our library pays for a lot of them. And if you're ever like, oh, I really want this article, talk to the library and they might be able to get it to, to you even if you don't have access to it. Now, there's two ways to find the scientific journal articles. And I really want to emphasize the word peer-reviewed here, because just because someone's talking about science, say in a magazine, and just because it's edited to make sure it sounds good, does not mean it's peer-reviewed. Peer review means I write a paper about climate change, and before it gets published into the scientific community, there are usually two to three other climate change scientists that read through the work, make sure it makes sense, make sure it's scientifically sound, and make sure that the climate change science is accurate. So the peers in peer review are other experts of that subject. So there's two ways that you can find these types of articles. The one that's accessible to everyone is Google Scholar, which you can access by going to scholar.google.com and just searching in whatever search terms you're looking for. It's better to be broader. Maybe you're interested in mercury and feathers in brown pelicans found in North Carolina. You can try searching for that, but that's really, really narrow. You might just start brown pelicans and mercury, or maybe even more general with brown pelicans and contaminants. So be a little bit more broad and then try narrowing it down. <coughs> Excuse me. Now with Google Scholar, not everything is available. Usually in the search results, it'll say on the right hand side, HTML available or PDF available. A lot of the times, I would say about 50% of the time in my experience, the articles aren't available. You can only read the abstract, but it gives you an idea of what's out there. The second way that you can find these articles is using our libraries through the college. You can access this by going to library.montgomerycollege.edu and there's a library button in the top right. Now when you go to the search box, so I've opened up a, a screen with it, here's what our library page looks like. Here's our search and I just typed in brown pelican and the key here is to click peer reviewed. MC Libraries has tons of different types of references, but we very specifically want peer-reviewed scientific journals, journal articles. Typically, if you're going to click peer-reviewed and type in some sort of term that somewhat relates to science, they're going to be scientific journal articles. And so that's how you can use our uh, MC Libraries webpage. The other thing you can do with an MC Libraries is if you want to use a particular database, uh, so you're looking at just the journals found in that database, JSTOR is a really good one. So you can read through these instructions on how to use a database. Uh, but for myself personally, I just use the general search. You can use other sources, you can use other websites, but really need to make sure that you understand who's writing it, why are they writing it, and where is their information coming from. Just because you read it online doesn't make it true. Just because you read it online doesn't mean that it's a good source. So take the time to really evaluate who it is that's creating that material. Now let's talk a little bit about you found that information and you want to use that information in a paper. In some of your other courses, you may have learned how to use direct quotes. Here's a sentence from them. I put it in my paper and I use direct quotes. In science, we very, very rarely use direct quotes. Nearly everything is paraphrased, mainly because I don't care that John Doe said that. What I care about is 
what he said. And I want to summarize what he said. So never use direct quotes. That doesn't mean, oh, I'll just take this word for word and just, I don't put quotation marks around it. Don't do that. That's plagiarism. So the key here is you want to paraphrase. Now, it's really easy if you don't understand your material to paraphrase really, really poorly and actually end up committing plagiarism. So a common mistake I see is someone reads a paragraph. So here's the paragraph. They don't quite understand it. And so what they do is they go sentence by sentence. Free ranging domestic cats have been introduced globally and have contributed to multiple wildlife extinctions on islands. So they might be like, uh, okay, well, um, wild domestic cats versus free ranging. Uh, introduced globally, introduced worldwide. That is still plagiarism. You are just using a thesaurus to change words. Do not do this. This is a zero on a paper. Um, this is things that can go to the academic review board. So just don't do that. If you don't understand something, take more time with it or find a different source. I like to think of paraphrasing, especially when you're having a difficult time, is take a paragraph from your text and paraphrase it into one sentence. Paraphrase those five to six to seven, eight sentences into one sentence. And then it's gonna be impossible <clears throat> to just use a thesaurus to change word by word. So here, I give you an example. I took that paragraph and I put it into a single sentence. And this is so key. I know it sounds simple, but the amount of zeros I have given while teaching because students think that changing one or two words makes it not plagiarism, same with rearranging it. Oh, I put the beginning of the sentence at the end and the end of the sentence at the beginning. That's not paraphrasing. Put it in your own words. If you were to tell someone else about this research, what would you say? So really make sure to read through this material just to make sure you really understand it. Now you may have noticed that in my paraphrase text, I have this citation. So that's what we're gonna talk about next. You may be familiar with MLA. APA is similar, just APA is used more in the science world, whereas MLA is used more in the humanities. And the idea behind it is the same. So there's two different parts of the citations. There is a reference list, that's everything at the end, and the in-text citation. And I'm actually gonna start with the reference list first because that might be what you're most familiar with. So reference page um, is on its own. So after the end of your paper, put in some spaces and make sure that the references are on their own page. It says references up top, and then you have your references listed underneath, very specifically in alphabetical order. We're gonna talk about why that matters in a little bit. You want it in uh, alphabetical order and you want this hanging indent like you see here in these examples where the first line is on the far left and then the subsequent lines are uh, indented. Do not do this manually. There are settings in Microsoft Word to do it automatically for you. The instructions for that are here. There's two different types of references you're going to probably be using in this course. Uh, one is the peer-reviewed scientific article. I'm not going to talk about every single thing you see here, but I have the general format and then I use an example so that you can see how this actually looks like filled in. If we're looking at a source, so I'm going to do a search here for brown pelicans and I'm going to look for a peer-reviewed journal article so that you get an idea of how to find this information. Sure, breeding brown pelicans, improve foraging performance, blah, blah, blah. In this case, I do need to log in with my M number just to make sure that I can access everything, but I think I'm already logged in, yeah. So here, it gives us the author names. Now you see it has a first and last name, but when you look at uh, the citation is supposed to be last name comma first initial. It says the source, so scientific reports is the journal uh, name. Here's the year it was published. Don't worry about day and month. We only care about the year. It tells you the volume number, tells you the issue number, it tells you the page numbers, which are all things that you need to put in your citation. And the reason for this is because we want to know how to find this article if I want to know more information. It's really easy to be like, oh, this is a website. I'm going to cite it as a website. 
That's not true. You're citing it as a peer-reviewed article because it is a peer-reviewed article. These actually get printed out. Very few people have them, but these are print uh, sources. Now using MC libraries, um, they do have some different tools here of how to cite things. You are more than welcome to copy and paste things. It's pretty accurate. Um, there have been one or two times where it's not accurate or it'll keep everything in caps lock or whatnot. So feel free to click that, use APA, copy and paste it, make sure it's correct. It is your responsibility to make sure it's correct. Likewise, let's say you don't get it from the MC libraries. Maybe you just found the PDF of something on Google Scholar. There's a couple things that you can do to find that information. Typically, the PDF will have it. So it has the author names. At the top, it tells you the journal name, scientific reports. And down here, it only gives you the year, but it doesn't tell you the volume number. It doesn't tell you the issue number. So what I like to do is I like to just copy and paste the title and just do a Google search on it. And likely, so I'm just gonna click the very first thing I found, likely you're gonna find some sort of report on it that gives you all that information. And there we are. So we've got um, volume 10, article number or issue number 1686, the year is 2020. Um, so you can do that and look for that information that way. The second type of resource that you're probably going to be using are websites. So websites, you need uh, quite a bit of information as well. Don't just be like, ah, epa.gov, here's the website link. You want author's names. You want the year it was published. You want the title of the page it came from. And then finally, the website address. Again, here's the general information and then here is an example below. So let's talk a little bit about this. So I have three websites here. This first one, I have an author, Rachel Neuer. I've got a year. I have a title for my page and I have a website. I now have all the information I need. But a lot of websites don't have that. So I'm going to go to an EPA website. So this EPA website doesn't have an author on it. Do not leave it blank. There is an author, it's the EPA. So in this case, the organization is gonna act as the author. We don't know who at the EPA did it, but someone at the EPA did. So your author in this case is EPA. There's also no year on it. Take a look down in the margins, particularly at the very end of the page. Uh, we can see that here on the EPA website, it says last updated on December 6th, 2018. So use that date 2018. That is the most recent information on this web page. One more. Uh, so we have NOAA. The title of the web page is Climate Data Online, but I see no author. So in this case, we're going to use NOAA as the author. We're going to use Climate Data Online as the website uh, title page, title name. Here's the website up here. And I'm scrolling down and there is no year and there might not be. So in that case, you're going to use ND for no date. The goal is to give as much information as possible. So again, if there is no author, like a straightforward author's name, use the organization as the author's name. Now, finally, I want to talk about the in-text citation. So you have this beautiful references list. And now we want to refer to those references within our writing to let people know who are reading our work where that information came from. And so here, the format of your in-text citation depends on how many authors are in that reference. So for example, let's say it was Noah. Well, that's only one author listed. So maybe they said birds are cool, and I'm just going to change this to Noah and the year it was published. In this case, on that NOAA website, there wasn't a year, so there's no date. If you have two authors, it's last name and ampersand, last name, comma, year, and then um, the period. So this goes at the end of a sentence. The period comes after the citation. So you see pelicans are the coolest birds, citation, then period. 
Finally, if there is more than three authors, then, or sorry, three authors or more, you list the first author, Arthur, et al., which in Latin is essentially meaning, and there's more, and the year. So no matter what it is, author, year, just depending on how many authors you have, is going to affect uh, how it's actually formatted. So these are, the, the point of in-text citations is to guide readers to the end reference if they want more info. So let me show you why this is important that your in-text citations match your end references. So here is something I wrote a very long time ago, and here are one of my in-text citations, Furness et al. 1986. I want to know what paper that was. And so I'm going to go down to the references list, and this is why it matters that they're alphabetized. I need to find Furness. Well, in this case, I have literally like seven or eight pages of references. So having them in alphabetical order is crucial. Even if you only have two references, put them in alphabetical order. So I'm going to go to Furness. And I have um, two listed. Now, if you remember, the citation uh, was 1986, so you can see that here. But also, this has three or more authors, hence the Furness et al., whereas this one had two. So it would have been listed as Furness and Kamphusen. So now if I look at my full citation, okay, here is the title of the journal, here's the journal it came from, the volume number, etc. So this is why we have an in-text citation and also why it's important that it matches. If my in-text citation said, using bird feathers, 1986, I would have such a hard time finding it in this reference list. So this is why our in-text citation is the author's last name, or it's the organization that you used for your reference so that I can look at that reference and then say, oh, here's how I can easily find it in my reference list. Here's where it is in my in-text citation. So really, really important that they're matching up. All right, and that is it. There is a lot more different ways to cite different resources. I personally recommend the Owl Purdue Lab. If you just Google that and write APA afterwards, they have how you cite books, how you cite newspapers, how you cite all sorts of different sources. But hopefully this was a great quick start guide for you so that you know how to cite some of the most commonly used materials.